you have you for first year your actual little science subject is your only additional subject to anything else so do the subject do the year yeah um because you're doing accounting you're doing a bit of economics you're doing maths you're doing stats you might find that maths was your passion at school but you really really enjoy the economic side of things yeah so it can expose your thing right you sometimes Absolutely. don't even know what it is that you like because you don't actually have the full set of information yeah, and it's difficult. I mean, your your son has just started his first year now. I mean, you must have seen that it's, it's difficult to make those decisions when you're 18. Like, it's, it's difficult to, to finish school and be like, what is it that I want to do with the rest of my life? Like, I'm sitting here at 29, and I'm still not sure what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Do you know what I mean? And it's actually a really difficult thing for, for a young person to work through because there is also a lot of pressure. And yeah. the job market's competitive, and there's a lot of things that they're dealing with. Um, and then to make that decision on top of it, and then feeling like you have to stick to that decision because now you've made it. To yeah. the meet where it's like, actually, I can't reconsider this decision because now I'm going to let everyone down. And actually being like, sometimes it's okay. Absolutely. And the thing is, like, my journey is in, in my personal I mean, back yeah, speak through that, actually, because I mean, I did a master's while, while working, and I, I think that would be really interesting to unpack. And so my first degree, I actually got in us 38. You amazed then. Because I, I studied with off study school. Yeah. I studied something completely different. Um, I studied design. Okay. Um, through, um, it was called Cape Tech at the time. Okay. Now it's Cape Peninsula Technology. Okay. Yes. I'm in UT. Um, so I did a, my first year was, I actually applied for graphic design, but I couldn't draw to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm also in that. <laughs> but I had, a, I, had, I knew that I was creative mm. some way along the line. So I did um, a design course um, and you do like fashion design, graphic design, jewelry design, industrial design. So you do a project on each one. Yeah. And then in your second year, you choose which stream you want to go into. Yeah. And so I got the highest mark for fashion, and yeah. I went into fashion design. Look at you. But I only stayed there for six months because I had to pay for my own studies. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up it was leaving. Sustainable. Yeah. It was a little bit of a financial decision, and also coupled with a little bit of racism. Oh, uh, that was in the nineties. So what was coming so out of the, the change way. of of and coming into democracy? Exactly, exactly. So a little bit of that, and plus I could have throw. <laughs> a little bit of a problem. So yeah. what, <laughs> my story pause. <laughs> nothing, nothing like that. But democracy and lacking of, <laughs> lack of drawing skills. <laughs> it's an interesting mix that. And then I ended up going to work in the bank. Okay. So I worked in financial institutions for a number of years. Which was probably really beneficial given the roles that you then took later on, right? Which you had no idea at the time. It's exactly. amazing how these things I don't know. interconnect, right? And you'll never be put in a place that you you won't learn anything from. 100%. There's always something to learn in every instance that you're in. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up in e-commerce for 10 years. Okay. I worked in online gaming. On a day, yes. I remember us talking about this. Yeah, really? yeah. again, some probability coming in there, some actuality. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have something. <laughs> Even though I see games, I'm sad <laughs> can come teach our race with the probability of winning the lottery. <laughs> and so, funny enough, right, you say that, but I worked in economics, there's a, there's a course called Game Theory. Of course. And, and that I found interesting. So somehow, we, uh, everything connects. Yeah, it connects, yeah. Um, yeah, and then when I worked at UCT, my first year at UCT, I then studied um, my first degree, which was Associate in Management yes. at the Business School, Yes, which was equivalent to an undergraduate degree. Got you. I did that, and that's where I studied operations for the first time. Okay. So I did HR, I did finance, I did um, a strategy, I did marketing, everything. Okay. And then I had a break. Over a few years, and then I went to do my postgraduate diploma in management practice, mm -hmm. um, and I specialized in social innovation. Okay, um, so it was a PG up Okay, uh, for one year, I did a project on each. So you basically get to write a research paper, could be on each block. So it's just four block, and you were but, working the whole time, and I was working. I'm not working. My first degree was exactly the same. So I think I had kids at the time. And I, my kids were very little that time, my first degree. So then um, they were still in preschool. Okay. 
Um, and I used to study. I said, I went to class. Blocks was two weeks. Sunday to Sunday, no excuses. You need to be in class from eight till six. I used to work from six till whatever time. So yeah. Sometimes I used to drive up from campus at three in the morning. Oh, weird. Um, and you, yeah, you have to be there. You have It's compulsory to be in every class. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's also learn to deal with group dynamics because you work in a group. Which is really people. important, right? And it's an underplayed skill, um, which I think a lot of our trail students, just sort of drawing it back to our context, don't necessarily have a lot of exposure to until mm-hmm. they get into the workplace. Yes. Um, and and that's not something you can learn theoretically. Yes. <laughs> you have to then be like, I can't stand this team member, <laughs> and, but I have to work with them because we have a common goal. Um, and also sometimes like you have a deliverable. Yeah. So, by the, so for the first, for my first year, every two weeks, you'll do work. And at the end of that two weeks, you need to present. Yeah. And you need to hand in something. Yeah. So if somebody in your group is not doing the work and not pulling their weight, you either have to like, step it up, kick him out, or, you know, you need you need to then, if you're the group leader, you need to make the decision. Yeah. Like, what do you actually do? Yeah. And I'm sure that this is exactly what happens in group dynamics with the students. Yeah. Um, somebody's got to do the referencing, and you finish writing up everything, and the reference is not done. Yeah. Um, or a financial part of it, whatever the case. Yeah, I mean, many yeah. aspects, yeah. And, and, that, and that's important, is learning to be, be able to talk to each other all the time. Yeah, which is not always something I think actuaries emphasize in their studies. You know, I mean, even with communications for actuaries, we do it much later on yeah. in the degree. And yet, if you can't communicate, you actually can't do anything. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 and it's not again something you can learn in theory. It's something you actually have to sit and be like, okay, I need to communicate something. Does this person understand me? Okay, they don't understand me. Let me try again. Yeah. Um, which can be very frustrating. And it's very different also coming from school because you had your close knit friends. Yeah. And yeah. now you put into a group with people you don't know. Yeah, because at school you're often allowed to choose your groups, right? So I think yes. then you get to university and you put with some student number that you've never met. <laughs> you know, you're like, sorry, can this person please put up their hand so that we can see that we're in the same group kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it is an interesting. But sorry, I interrupted you there. So you did this very intensive course where you're doing these research projects every block. Mm-hmm. And then after that, did you pursue your master's? Is that when you... No, so I, I took a break. But okay. then I still did other things in between. Um, I did... Um, it started with conversation in the kitchen. So I always wanted Classic. to write the paper. Because <laughs> when I was doing my projects, I kind of really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the research part and I enjoyed writing up. Mm-hmm. I don't write academically. Well, I don't think I write academically. Mm-hmm. I write more as a story, like yeah. a case study type yeah. thing. And then Ines and I were having a conversation and I said to her, oh, I'd really love to go to a conference, write the paper and go to a conference. And mm. she challenged me. She so, said, well, now what's stopping you? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, there's a conference in a couple of months' time. Write something up, submit it. If they accept your paper, then we take it from there. So, <laughs> And, um, yeah, so... I then wrote a paper on food. Mm. So I wanted to always write something about food. I feel like food connects people in different ways. That's with you and your sweeties, eh? Food is a feed. Exactly that. And um, I wrote uh, a paper on food. Yeah. It was called uh, Food for Inclusion. Okay. And I submitted it to uh, the conference and I was accepted as well. I went to Canada. Amazing. And I went to Bone Prison. I travel for the first time in my life. Bone Prison. <laughs> I never do anything. So I'm an only child and I never do anything on my own. Funny enough. Which is interesting. You would have thought that you would have done more given that you Yeah, so <laughs> interesting. But I always had people close to me. Of course. I mean, you and you my husband and I were together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my husband and I. Shout out to Oliver. Together. <laughs> so yeah, we together for over 30 years. So oh. we dated for 11 years and this year we've been married for oh, 20. Oh, congrats. That's so special. Thank you. So yes, I've never been alone and we've never traveled anywhere apart. Okay. okay. So this was like a big, a big, big thing, thing for you. Um, and yeah, thanks to Edis and our encouragement, um, I went to present at EDI, which is um, the conference in Canada. Okay. And um, when we were there, in actual fact, I said to Ines, this is such a nice conference, we should bring it back to Cape Town. Okay. And Ines said, 
got in contact to the people and we chatted about it with them and stuff and they came to check it out and then we collaborated with the GSB oh, with yay. Kurt Angel. Yes. Um and yeah, we hosted two years ago. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Amazing. And tell me, I mean you've talked about being interested in social innovation and in food. What exactly would social innovation involve? Like what was the study that you did there? So the social innovation part is what you're going to do for society. Okay. It's your giving back. Within the so, management framework or that administrative framework. It can mean anything. Okay. Okay. So, so it could be starting a food scheme for, okay. for, for, for people that don't have any food. Okay. Going back and teaching underprivileged children. Okay. Um, my master's, my first master that I wanted to do actually was a master's in um, innovation. Mm-hmm. Um, but m- I felt my community was a duty. Okay. And I felt like my community was administrative staff. Okay. At UCT. Um, and I think because I sat on BD selection committees because I was also part of the Employment Equity Committee. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in that space, in the transformation space and employment equity space for 10 years. Sure. So I headed up the employment equity training okay. in our faculty, in fact. Um, and I felt like... Which again is so interesting, saying that when you had studied design, you had encountered racism and the, the difficulties around that period of time and then bringing that into later work, right? Yes. It's amazing it's, how these things connect again. And, I, and I, again, the, it was, I found a different something that was missing yeah like you know so sitting on various selection committees i felt like you know um you've got to follow things by the book yeah um, there has to be policy and like nice specific like structure but there's so many people sitting with a wealth of knowledge and experience mm-hmm. in their role but they didn't have an opportunity to study a formal degree yes um, and I come from that school. Yes. So a lot of my friends, actually, um, or my peers, we, there wasn't a lot of us that, we, that could afford to go and study yes. after school, straight after yes. school. So we had to work. We ended up work, A lot of us ended up working at banks mm-hmm. um, and at all financial institutions. Mm-hmm. And you saw it like as a secretary. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, it was called secretary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not a PA. Secretary. <laughs> secretary or switchboard operator. Hey. Well, you just answer the phone and transfer the calls yes. to everyone. Um, but then growing there, you would use, the company would they pay for your studies. Yes. But there were some people that obviously did not get that, but they would move up the ranks. Yes. But applying for the next role. Was um, difficult if you didn't have a formal or something. Or something. qualification, yeah. Like today, because you need a second year diploma, for example. Um, you need, I mean, some of our students need with an undergraduate degree and end up going to work in industry, but not doing what they studied. Mm. They're just using the degree to get their foot in the door, Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and I think like at UCT specifically, I find that there's a lot of people with a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. The really wealth of knowledge. I get married, they start a family. And they don't have the time to actually go. Yeah, your life things. changes. Um, and then they, they look again and they're looking after their, their parents. Yeah. So don't have that opportunity. Um, and so I think that was my community and I want to make okay. a change thing. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how yet, but I mean, I would love to do some cross skill um, training. Yeah. Um, uh, and just try to also take the experiences and almost equate it to a degree. Yeah, it's like saying these are your proficiencies and these proficiencies almost are equivalent to credits that we would give to a student in, in a degree and then you, you kind of give them a, a degree with virtue of their experience Correct. and their skill set that they can show, which is it's very interesting. I think in many ways the world is moving that way, you know, um, in that there are a number of jobs that are starting to, or a number of employers that are starting to look for skill sets more than qualifications. Um, and so they're interested in underlying proficiency, not where you got it from. Yeah, yeah. Which I think in, in many ways is right, you know, um, you want to know that the person can do the job. It doesn't matter where they, where they necessarily got the skill from, sure. as long as they have the skill to do the job. Sure. Um, and not everyone does have equal opportunity. Sure. But I think, that that's, um, I think that that's really exciting um, and, and obviously very needed, right, um, in, in various communities. 
I think, both in South Africa and, and further afield. Yes. But to bring it back to our actuarial space um, and how all of these sort of things that you've done throughout your career have inputted into the role that you play now, what are some of the tips you would give 